Book of Romans, Book of Romans, Chapter 3. Um, we're preparing to partake from the Lord's table in just a few moments. You know, as you're turning there, you know, one of the most impressive supernatural occurrences in the Bible is described in Numbers, Chapter 22. Balaam was a headstrong prophet. He was intent on going to Balak and giving him a prophecy. Actually, we know that Balak wanted, but Balaam wasn't really on the same page as God. And nonetheless, Balaam set out to go toward Balak. And as he was riding a donkey and making his way toward uh, the ungodly king, unbeknownst to Balaam, um, an angel was blocking the path. And so the donkey, which was set on that path, actually perceived what Balaam didn't, saw the angel, and began to turn off into a field, angering Balaam. And Balaam beat the donkey and got him back on the right path. And the scripture says they went along a little while later. And they came toward a vineyard. And in this vineyard, there was a tight passageway. There was a wall on each side. And again, uh, poor Balaam didn't see what was happening in the spirit realm, but the donkey did. And so the donkey saw the angel blocking the path, and he stopped, and he began to buck toward the side, and he caught Balaam's foot against the wall. Balaam beat the donkey and fussed at him again. And uh, so then they made their way on a little while longer on the trip. And the angel just squatted down right in the midst, seeing the angel. And Balaam, would, by that time, was really angry. And he beat and fussed again at the donkey. And then this great surprise happened. The donkey spoke. And he said, basically, Balaam, you know me. You know I've never done this, nor would I do this. So there must be something going on. And at that time, God opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel standing uh, in the passageway. I would have loved to have been there. Could you imagine what happened when he beat that donkey and fussed at him the third time, and that donkey began to speak? I bet you could have bought him for a dollar. <laughs> but you know, many times God uses speech in an unusual way. For instance, last Sunday during our business meeting, I shared a brief devotion out of Psalm chapter 19. And in that Psalm, we see God's specific revelation through his word. That's how we know who God is through his word. But there's also the general revelation of created order. As we look out into the heavens, into the skies, they give testament to the Lord God. A day comes and day goes. The sun, all of the created order, uh, the scripture says day after day they pour out speech that there is a God, but he adds that their speech is not with audible words, but rather through example, through what we observe, uh, they're communicating the reality of God. Now I checked this morning when I got up, the sun didn't say good morning to me. I didn't hear it audibly, um, but God speaks. And you know, God speaks through this table that is before me, uh, representing the elements of the Lord's table. Again, when I came in this morning, just to unlock and check on things, it didn't say, good morning, Rick. But it speaks to us nonetheless. It speaks to us through what it represents. And today, I, I want to look at Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 26, and then we're going to tie that in with our observance of the Lord's Supper today. Verse 19 of Romans 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. For no one will be justified in God's sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his restraint, 
right. God passed over the sins previously co committed. God presented him, that is Jesus, to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word this morning for these few moments, we know that the word that we read in this table before us both attest to the fact that we are sinners, that we can do nothing in and of ourselves to make ourselves right with you. Lord, we're dependent fully upon your mercy and grace, and we thank you that through the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, we have the opportunity through faith to claim that life, eternal life, the forgiveness of sins for ourselves. Father, we love you. Pray your speaking in this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as we prepare to take from the table today, we do so differently. You know, for the last, it seems like about three years now, I guess, we have uh, done so the way you have it. It's in your possession. So you say, well, Rick, why did you have the table set up? Well, if you were to open up the, the middle part, there, there are no little uh, cups with uh, uh, juice in them. If you were to go up and, and see the plates, there's no bread there. But what I hope today is that it's symbolic as we prepare our hearts that we, what we look at this table and we understand really what it speaks to us today. You know, Romans 3 is one of the great chapters in the Bible. The verses leading up to our morning's text uh, in earlier in chapter 3 speak to the fact that none of us is righteous. All of us or depraved, that there is nothing that we can do. We can't even understand spiritual truth apart from the grace of God. If you look in your Bible, if yours is like mine, there are a lot of bold prints basically between verses 10 through 18, which is just a repetition of Old Testament prophets or the book of Psalms. And so we see that they're repeated. Hey, it's enough if it's there just once in the Bible. It's enough for me. But we see that it is emphasized here the fact that all of us are sinners, that none of us is righteous. No matter what we think about ourselves, the truth is we stand in need of the grace of God. And so today we pick up here in verse 19 with that theme. And this table again is symbolic and it speaks to us really two things that I want to observe today. And the first thing is this, this table tells us that man is in a serious predicament. When Jesus established the Lord's Supper on the night before he was cru crucified, he was expect expressing rather the truth about his sacrifice, that he would deliver man from the predicament of sin. Now, the person without faith in Jesus Christ is indeed in a terrible predicament because, again, looking at those verses that precede our text, there is no one in and of himself or herself who is righteous. There is no one who truly understands. All alike, it tells us in verse 12, have become worthless. No one does good, verse 13. The path of peace they have no understanding or knowledge of. And so here in verse 19, continuing that, Paul says, now whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law. Now, who were those who were subject to the law? They were Jews. They were given the law. Paul speaks later in the book of Romans of the privilege of the Jews. And so the Jews possessed the law. But notice what it says. You, those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut. In other words, we have no response. It would be like if someone were to accuse us of something and we knew we were guilty and all we can do is silently receive the condemnation. That's what it means. Every mouth is shut. He, he said, okay, you Jews who think that you're more righteous than those who were not given the law just because God chose to give you the law. Don't think that you're righteous because as you observe the law and the law speaks to you, you have nothing to stay in say in response. 
You stand in silence, not as a law keeper, but as one who has broken the law. James 2.10 says this, that if anyone keeps all of the law, yet transgresses in just one part, that individual is guilty of all of it. What it means is it's all in. If you say that I'm going to be made right with God by keeping the commandments of God perfectly in and of my own strength, then, then you better live a perfect life. There's only one who's lived a perfect life, though, and that's Jesus Christ. We all are guilty, whether it be the Old Testament law for the devout Jew or at that time the Gentiles who in their consciences had a law of what was right, what was wrong. Nonetheless, the law does not justify us. It condemns us. This table confirms that our right standing with God comes not by what we have done. It is not our body, our blood that's represented here, but by what God has done through Jesus Christ as our sacrifice. And that moves to the second truth about our predicament. What the law could not do, Jesus did. See what Paul writes in, in verse 20 there. For no one will be justified in God's sight by the works of the law. Because knowledge of sin comes through the law. Is the law good? The scripture says it certainly is. Paul affirms this truth elsewhere in the book. The issue is not the goodness of the law. The issue is the badness of us. The law speaks to us, even if this table speaks, that says that we're sinners it silences us. It doesn't justify us. I've shared before, one of the most memorable experiences of my childhood was when my dad bought the first microwave oven I ever knew. And now we don't think anything of it, but I'm telling you, when it, the first advent of the microwave, not the subsequent editions, but the first one was big, about as big around as this. Dad brought it home, and we all stand in amazement as we were, we were able to watch popcorn pop in a bag, and the bag didn't burn up. I mean, we were just amazed at it. And microwaves are great. In other words, sometimes, now I'm only one mug a day. I'm, I'm not a coffee-aholic, but I do like my one mug of coffee a day. And sometimes maybe I get distracted. I drink about two-thirds of it, and it's sitting there. If it's in that mug, I'll just pop it in the microwave for about 30 seconds and warm it up. But if it's in a styrofoam cup, I'm not going to do that. Because what happened, a microwave is not good for a styrofoam cup. It will melt it. It will cause all types of chemicals that are bad. So microwaves are good for what they do, but it doesn't accomplish everything. The law does many good things. The law helps us to understand God's standard. It sets guidelines for us. And then there's the one thing that Paul expresses here, the goodness of the law at the end of verse 20, is the knowledge of sin comes through the law. In other words, we sinned, man sinned before the law was given to the nation of Israel through Moses. But, but once the law came, we were able to clearly understand sin for what it is. So through the law, we become aware of our sin, which is a good thing. But all the law does is it helps us to understand our problem. It doesn't fix it. It would be like if someone would come work on, on your house and they say, okay, you hire them to fix it. And they say, okay, we found the problem. Here's the problem. Then they get in the truck and leave. You say, well, that's only half of the issue. At least I know the problem. I need it fixed. The law helps us to see the problem, but the law does not justify us before God. And so as we observe this table today, it speaks to us this, what the law could not do, Jesus did. What we cannot do, Jesus did for us. And that leads us to a second general truth. This table tells us that God has given us a glorious provision. Verses 21 through 26 speak to us some truths about Jesus' sacrifice. And, and I want to look at these real briefly. The first one is this. It, this table speaks, and this word in Romans 3 speaks this truth. God is exacting. You know, sometimes exacting can be a, a negative word. It can have a negative, uh, a negative uh, connotation. For instance, uh, you say a person's exacting. Boy, they're hard on somebody. Boy, they're rigorous. And, and really, if we look at it, 
God is exact. There's really no nebulous area, no gray area with God. We studied the 70 years of, uh, of exile in Babylon. And, and, and I know in Sunday school last week, and part of it, Second Chronicles 36, 20, and 21, tells us that this number 70 wasn't just a random thing. It was very significant. It represented the number of Sabbath years that were neglected by the people of Israel. And so God didn't say 65. He didn't say 70. He didn't even say 50, which we might consider to be more round, but he said 70 years, and it said for one in every seven years, for the 490 years, they neglected the word of God. In other words, God keeps count. Here in Romans 3.25, God keeps count. God is holy. He cannot allow sin in his presence. But God is loving, and he desires that we be in his presence. We can't do it. We've already seen in the two first, first two verses today, we can't justify ourselves. But yet there's still the issue, and God has an answer. The answer is Jesus. Notice what it said, verse 25. God presented him, mine says, as the mercy seat, yours may say as the atonement, the propitiation, which carries the idea that Jesus came to take our punishment on him. In other words, propitiation, that idea carries the idea of averting the wrath of God. Now, God's wrath is not some uncontrolled thing that we think if we explode, but this is God's righteous and holy response towards sin. And guess what? God, who is an exacting God, said this sin must be paid for, and it will be directed toward Jesus. He took it upon himself. But notice what it says. To demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. In other words, in the Old Testament, there was the Old Testament sacrificial system. You had the Passover feast. You had all of the uh, sacrifices that were offered. But Hebrews 10 says none of those were sufficient to pay the price for sin. If a, they had been, Paul said, or, or the writer of Hebrews says, if they had been, then they would have ceased. But Jesus came and once for all paid the price. In other words, what Paul is saying here, there were all those sins of the Old Testament saints. They needed to be declared righteous. There was not sufficient payment, but God came behind that and in an exact way took care of it by taking it upon himself. God is exacting. As we look at this table, it tells us that God didn't just bypass the sins of those in the past or those now. He didn't just say, well, that's okay. He exactly took it upon himself. But I want you to see, secondly, this table, this scripture tells us God is attentive. There was a false uh, doctrine in the Age of Enlightenment in the 1700s and 1800s that spoke of the, the nature of God, deism. You've heard that term before. Deism was really a, a cancer on the truth of God's word. The deist would say this, that God started up this world. He's a creator God, but then he just separated himself from it, that he just walked away from it. And, and they would say, God's like the great uh, watchmaker that made the watch, wound it up, and then sent it on its own. And so a lot of people would try to justify and say, well, uh, man is responsible for himself and this false teacher, uh, false teaching was a terrible thing. But that's not what the scripture teaches. It's not what this table teaches. This table teaches that God came to us and suffered for us, that God is attentive to us. Notice what it says in verse 25 and 26, the first uh, um, Three ver words of each verse. Verse 25, God presented him. Verse 26, God presented him. That's not a God who is disinterested, who just started it off and went on his own path and separated himself. This is a God who cares. The God who created the world when he saw his nation Israel uh, in bondage in Egypt and heard their cry and saw their affliction, acted and sent his agent Moses. And when God sees us in our sins, in the bondage of sin, he does even better. He sends his own son to die for us. And so in verse 24, 
Those who trust in Christ are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So God presented him, and through that, he is our redemption. Again, not that God is, is some separated being who's not concerned with us, but one who has presented Jesus to us and one who has provided Jesus as the redemption. You may remember in the Old Testament, Hosea was married to a wayward woman named Gomer. And Gomer had played the field and, and left him and had played a, a harlot. And God told Hosea, he said, I want you to go. I want you to go and I want you to pay and he had a specific payment, 15 shekels of silver, nine bushels of barley, and buy back your wayward wife. Boy, I'm sure that was tough, but he did it. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what our verse here, verse 23, tells us. We're like Gomer. We have sinned. We've fallen short. We sinned in the past. We're guilty. But through Jesus, God who actively pursues us, sent Jesus to die for us. His blood is our redemption. God's attentive to our need. But I want you to see a third truth. God is non-discriminatory. In other words, God does, not God does not divide us. He loves everyone. He doesn't discriminate. He doesn't play favorites. He does not reject anyone based on what they've done on the, in the past, based on their culture, based on their race, based on their background. God loves everyone. Look at what it says in verse 22. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. His grace does not discriminate. You know, sometimes we'll look at people and we'll see how hard a life they live or we'll look at someone in prison and we'll begin to categorize as if that they weren't in any way should be concerned of God and we begin to lift up ourselves. Listen, I've seen God save people that you and I would be amazed at that God would do and turn their lives around. Paul himself, who wrote this, was, was involved in the abduction and the killing of Christians. He called himself the utmost of sinners. But God saved him. And then he writes later, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So what does this table tell us? We look at what is represented in the elements today. It tells us we can't do it. We can't. That, that we're sinners. That we're in a predicament. That we've gotten ourselves in the web of sin. And the harder we try, the more we'll be tied into it. We can't save ourselves. This table tells us that God, though, is exacting. That God doesn't just look and say, well, that happened. Well, well we're just going to know. He took it upon himself. There was a specific payment for your sin, believer. He doesn't discriminate. If anyone would call upon him, that person would be saved. I wonder today if you trusted in Christ. This table says anyone who will can. But it also says that we're to come to this table in a worthy manner because of the, the sacred aspect of this table, that it represents God's attentive love for us. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, I tell you today on the authority of God's word, you're in a predicament. In this predicament, you can't fix yourself. You need to cry out to God and say, God, save me. God, do for me what I can't do for myself. God, I'm a sinner. I need you in my life. I turn from a life where I'm running my own agenda, my own schedule, and I look to you. Let's pray. Father, as we partake from this table today, this table without a word is speaking to our need and to your provision. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God of detail, that, Lord, you didn't just pass over the sins eternally and just neglect them. But, Father, you paid the price yourself. 
We thank you, Lord, that you're attentive to our need. Even as you look down on the nation of Israel when they were in bondage and you sent a deliverer, even greatly, even more greatly, you sent Jesus to us to deliver us from sin, the redemption that comes through his blood. And Father, we thank you that anyone who, who will can come today. Father, if there be anybody who's not trusted Christ, we pray your spirit will continue to work in their lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to operate a little bit differently today. Rather than do the invitational hymn you see in the bulletin, we're going to actually go right into observing the Lord's Supper. And so I'm going to come down on platform, off of the platform where you are, if you'll get yourself ready for that. And then we'll close with our, our hymn of invitation.